Hi everyone, my name is Akshay Chaudhary and thanks for tuning in to the latest MRM highlights video where we'll be talking about super resolution musculoskeletal MRI using deep learning, which was recently chosen as the editor's pick for MRM for the month of November 2018. So I just wanted to start off by motivating why methods like this are useful uh, by talking about current implementation of MSK imaging protocols in MRI. So from a clinical perspective, we typically require the ability to interrogate tissues in the MSK system at different uh, scan orientation, just because there's a lot of subtle tissues and pathologies may lie in arbitrary scan orientations. From a research perspective, we want to be able to quantify subtle morphological changes that occurs in diseases such as osteoarthritis. For example, we want to evaluate changes in cartilage thickness or meniscal locations, all of which requires high resolution MR imaging. However, the current problem with MSK MR protocols is that 2D sequences such as FASTFIN ECHO uh, are the usual workhorse. While they can provide extremely high in-plane resolution and really ex exquisite in-plane images, their through-plane resolution is quite thick, um, and there's often slice gaps between multiple slices also. This is why we typically have to repeat 2D scans with a lot of times the same image contrast in multiple different scan planes which leads to a lot of redundancy in the imaging protocol um, and adds overall time and costs to your image acquisition process. So with this as a goal, uh, our goal for this study was to be able to generate high re resolution thin slice MRI uh, by starting off with low re resolution thick slice images as the input during neural network. So the specific experiment that we performed here was to see whether we can acquire thin slice images so roughly 0.7 millimeter slice thickness, be able to simulate the acquisition of thicker slices. And in this case, we chose 3x, but we sweep through a lot of different downsampling choices. And then once we have these uh, thick slices, to see whether we can use a convolutional neural network to be able to recover the thin slice images by starting off with the thick slice images. So the theory behind this is this concept called super resolution which has existed in computer vision literature for a couple of decades by now. And the general premise for that is starting off with some low resolution blur image, can we learn using some image priors what the high resolution representation of that image actually looks like? And with recent advances in computer vision, we've seen that instead of predicting this high resolution image from scratch, what's actually easier is if we predict this residual image. And what this residual is, is it's simply a difference between your high res and the low resolution image. And since this residual is relatively sparse um, in multiple different domains, uh, it's a computationally easier problem to be able to predict this image and simply add it to the low resolution data set than to predict this high resolution image from scratch. So the way we do this with our neural network, which we call Deep Resolve, is we start off with some high resolution ground truth data. Uh, so in this case, we have 0.7 millimeter slices, and then we simulate the acquisition of a low resolution uh, version of that same slice. And that ratio is known as a downsampling factor. Uh, and in this case, we're downsampling four slices to a single slice. Next, we interpolate this low resolution slice to the slice locations that we actually want from our output. And then iteratively, we learn this residual map between the interpolated images, as well as the high resolution ground truth images. And this process carries on during the training process um, by sweeping through the entire training data set. Then during testing, what we can do is we can simply start off with some low resolution data set, interpolate to the resolution that we want, approximate what the residual should be, and then that's how we end up with this high resolution, super resolution data set. So the neural network that we use to do this um, is a cascade of 3D convolutional filters uh, stacked on top of each other. Um, and in this case, we use 20 convolutions, which makes this a very, very deep network uh, so that we can extract high level features from the image. So we start off with a low resolution in, uh, input image which goes through a cascade of these deep neural networks. Um, and then for the final layer, um, we don't perform any sort of activation because we want to predict a residual image, which may have either positive or negative values. And then once we reach upon this estimation, um, we simply perform a summation with a low resolution image, 
and then we generate a high resolution image output. And this entire training process is constrained by the L2 loss between the high resolution output, which is predicted by the network, and the ground truth high resolution data set to begin with. In terms of the specifics of the training, we start off with a double echo steady state sequence, which has a very high resolution, and uh, it has 384 by 384 by 160 slices to start off with. And since 3D convolutions are computationally expensive, instead of training on the whole 3D data set, we train on small patches of dimensions 32 cubed, and we have a stride in every dimension uh, of 16. Um, and in addition to looking at the L2 loss between the super resolution and the original resolution images, we also evaluate the structural similarity and the peak signal to noise ratio to have a quantitative assessment of how well the neural network is working. In our training data set, we have 124 patients. For validation, we have 35, and for testing, we have 17. And what's interesting to note is that all of these uh, subjects that are used in the training, validation, and testing um, have a nice distribution of kelgren lorentz grades from one through four. And what these correspond to is the severity of osteoarthritis activity in the knee, with four being the highest level of osteoarthritis one can have. What this really means is that our input training data set has seen not only healthy knees, but also a wide range of pathologic knees too. So the network is minimally biased in that regard. For comparisons, uh, we compare our super resolution outputs to the ground truth data sets, as well as uh, tricubic interpolated and four interpolated images. And this is useful because a lot of DICOM viewers typically perform some sort of interpolation method while we're viewing uh, the DICOM images. And a lot of scanners uh, perform Fourier interpolation in order to increase the perceived image quality of images. And we also compare this method to a non-data-driven approach, which is known as sparse coding super-resolution, which has previously been applied to MRI. In addition to evaluating quantitative metrics, um, we also wanted to have two experienced musculoskeletal radiologists assess these images because quantitative metrics don't necessarily always correspond to image quality as perceived by humans, especially radiologists who will be using these images. Um, so these radiologists assess the ground truth images, the deep resolve images, and the tricubic interpolated images. They looked at the entire volume plus the reformats, and they evaluated the diagnostic image quality for contrast, sharpness, signal to noise, as well as artifact levels. So here, here is an example of what the network can actually do. And this is a coronal reformation uh, of the deep resolve inference, which only took 10 seconds to predict 160 slices. So this can work really in real time. So this is the ground truth image. And what I'd like to point your attention to is this medial collateral ligament, which runs down here. In the interpolated images, that collateral ligament is entirely blurred out. However, the deep resolve network can recreate it with quite high image fidelity. In addition, it can also recreate this osteophyte and uh, vasculature quite well compared to the ground truth images. Well, it's entirely blurred in the tricubic interpolated images. You can see a lot of undersampling artifacts. It looks like a little bit of Gibbs ringing too. So the deep resolve network can generate these images with quite high fidelity. And this is for 3x undersampling. And here we can see the structural similarity maps, uh, where for these thin collateral ligaments as well as the cartilage, we see very high structural similarity. But for the tricubic interpolated images, the collateral ligaments have lower structural similarity, which is kind of guided by the images that we see. And next, we wanted to see what are the limits of this network by e evaluating this network for a variety of downsampling factors. So basically answering the question, how thick a slice can I start off with if I want to recover a thin slice? And we can see that as our downsampling factor increases, we can start seeing generalized blurring of the image. And if we keep looking at this medial collateral ligament, roughly after a downsampling factor of four or so, we see that the ligament starts being blurred out. So what this suggests is if we kind of stay in a paradigm of around two to four X downsampling for this particular training paradigm, uh, the neural network can actually work quite well. This is an assessment of the reader study uh, that compared the ground truth, deep resolve, and tricubic interpolated images. And we can see that pretty much for all metrics, uh, the deep resolve method outperformed the current standard of interpolation. 
Um, and for some metrics such as sharpness, there are still significant differences between the ground truth and deep resolve. However, um, that wasn't necessarily the goal of the study to see whether we can exactly recreate uh, the high resolution images. We just wanted to see if we can do better than currently used methods such as interpolation. Um, and the results here were quite promising because there are still very minimal differences uh, between the ground truth and deep resolve uh, data sets. And then an additional question we wanted to ask is, how is subtle pathology represented um, by the network? So here's an example of a potential meniscus tear, um, which can be seen in a coronal reformation. So the meniscus is this region right here, and we can see a zoomed in inset. Uh, we see an, a region of increased signal intensity that's touching the articular surface. Um, and if we evaluate the morphological image quality of the ground truth image and the deep resolve image, it looks pretty similar. You can evaluate this high signal as it touches the cartilage. However, for the tricubic interpolated images, um, everything seems diffusely blurred out and it's challenging to delineate where the meniscal tear ends and where the inflammation begins. So this would be quite challenging to call from a diagnostic perspective. So overall, even for pathology, the deep resolved network works quite well. So in conclusion, we just wanted to show that deep learning based super resolution was able to enhance MRI slice resolution in this data set, and that it might be promising uh, to be applied in clinical and research uses. Obviously, there is a lot more validation that's required uh, to see what are some of the impacts that this network can have. But this could be an additional way in which we can accelerate MR image acquisition. And with this, I would just like to acknowledge uh, the group members from the Brian Hargreaves lab, as well as the Gary Gold lab, who were very useful um, in helping get the study up and running. And I'd also like to acknowledge your funding sources.